Hello everyone. Recently, few of the viewers requested uh, to make a system design video about ClickInfo, ClickBuzz, or ESPN Sports like website. And here are the requests. In this session, let's learn how ClickInfo works or how to design system like ClickInfo or ClickBuzz. Before attempting to design system for any given application, you need to know what is the load or traffic for that particular application. If you're answering in an in interview, you can make some assumption or talk to your interviewer about the traffic. Or if you're implementing the application at your job or for yourself, what you can do is you can find some website which are of similar type and then you can go to alexa.com slash site info or you can go to similweb.com to get the approximate traffic. Here you can get total visits um, to that particular site, average visit duration, page per visit or bounce rate. And also it will show traffic by country. In this case, click info, uh, I got the information from uh, similarweb.com. It shows that about 2.3 million requests in a day and most of the request is coming from India and uh, about 29% of the request coming from the United States. This way, you know what is the approximate traffic which might come to your website and also you know from which location more people visit your site. That way you exactly know uh, how to curate your content for that particular country or location. And also it helps you to decide uh, the location for your data center or to choose the location for your servers in Amazon.com or any server provider. And also it helps you to understand your potential users behavior, like what kind of devices your users are uh, using uh, to browse your website. Uh, is it mobile or is it desktop or is it gaming console, etc. That way you can model your system uh, design uh, to fit these requirements. Say in Click Info, more and more people are visiting from um, mobile phones through their applications or through website. That gives you a hint that you need to push live updates instead of um, like pull request, it will be more of a push updates. That means that we should have some kind of real time push mechanism using web sockets or something. Click Info has its backend completely on Amazon. It uses Amazon infrastructure heavily. It has, cap it has built capabilities like it can send 1 million WebSocket updates in about very few seconds, like less than a second or 500 milliseconds like that. So now let's learn how ClickInfo service or system will get the real-time score updates. So now in this image, you can see that there is a studio or stadium where the players are playing the cricket or the match is going on. And here there is a score update service or portal. And here there are two people. One person is commentator and another person is the score updater. These two people usually sits in ClickInfo office. And also there is live TV. And here you can see there is ClickInfo system. There are two strategies to sync the real-time score to the ClickInfo system. The first one is automated service wherein the, the stadium will send the updates to the score update service and in turn store, score update service will update the data or uh, scores, wickets and runs to the click info system. The second strategy is manual updation. In this case, the data or the real time scores will not be updated from the stadium. Instead, the, these two people, the commentator will be commentating um, and also the score updater will be updating the score by looking at the TV. Uh, usually TV will be live TV and uh, it will have very less latency or delay. That is about two to three seconds. And that is fine as they can seamlessly watch the uh, television and the scores will be updated, uh, will be available readily in the television and then they will take the score and then update. Oftentimes um, they can also leverage um, OCR, uh, softwares or optical character recognition on the TV screen or uh, the TV feed uh, output uh, to leverage uh, the automatic update of the score to the ClickInfo system. Now that we learned how to import the real-time score from Stadium to ClickInfo system, you must be thinking that how hard it is to provide the data which we have in our database or in cache to the viewer.
viewers or to the applications or web apps. It's about creating APIs, right? But I'll tell you that nothing works at scale. It's all, even simple things will get complicated. ClickInfo has a lot of information. Information like player's profile, live score when the match is going on, and also scores, statistics when the match is finished, calendar information about the matches, headlines, teams, leaderboards, and photos. With all this information, ClickInfo also it shares this information with third-party websites and uh, different applications like, um, you know, you, you might be knowing a lot of Android games or iOS games like Dream Eleven, where you can make your own team and then play, bet, and etc. Right? These games also need to know the real-time uh, information or statistics or the profile run rate, scores, or wickets taken for every different uh, cricket players. So these games consume this kind of data from Cricket for or any other sports related website. And also uh, there are some websites which have sports section in them. They need to show the information. They rely on Cricket Info to get that information also. And a lot of news TV channels or local TV, they can't afford to uh, get the licensing from Cricket Association to uh, show the data, right? So all these different third parties will have access to the Crick Info's customized APIs for these third party vendors. And since these guys are the one who pays a lot of money to Crick Info, Crick Info should prioritize the traffic from the th uh, third party applications over their own applications sometimes. And also they need to make sure that they are meeting the quality of service. With that comes the complexity. As different third-party vendors as for different kind of APIs, ClickInfo should customize APIs for each and every different vendors. There can be like tons of APIs ClickInfo should write to help uh, to serve the data to these third-party vendors. And that will be the tedious process. And that is the main reason why I said that the simple MVC pattern or simple a website with some APIs exposed to the front end or application will not help you to scale the Crick Info system. With so much of data and so many APIs, we can easily say or we can easily infer that Crick Info is a really heavy system as the input is a lot less, that is maybe uh, scores, wickets, overs of a particular match once it is stored into the database. Most of the times, viewers will access this data through different APIs, not just viewers, also third party access this data through different APIs. That's why this system is really heavy. And here is this total system designed for ClickInfo. The core problem of ClickInfo is we have the data and we need to serve this data to our end users without much latency. Since it is sports uh, website and sports fans want to know the scores in real time. And that is the crux of the system design for ClickInfo. So now how do we solve that? Let's go with microservice architecture and let's also divide the APIs into two categories called as core APIs and product APIs. What are core APIs? Core APIs are the APIs which serves the basic uh, entity of the information for any given game. For example, in case of ESPN.com, yeah, the core APIs will be like uh, a set of core APIs which serves only for football and a set of APIs which serves for cricket, a set of APIs for MotoGP, for example, like that. So the core APIs are group of APIs which gives you basic information like one API which gives you score update of a given match, one, one more API which gives statics, statistics information, one more API which gives you all the other metadata, something like that. So we have to identify the granularity or the basic entity of information of any uh, given dif different kind of information. And we need to develop those APIs. And product APIs sits on top of the core APIs, core APIs. What it does is when the third party requests for a combination of data, something like this. As you can see, um, something like this, as you can see, it has tons of information. 
This is one um, sample response I have taken from Crickinfo. If you see, there are tons of data over here, right? And uh, it is it is it is a little difficult to get all of this information at one shot from a single API and then serve it back to a third party vendor or Crickinfo's applications or website. What you have to do is break this API into separate entities and then build APIs for those entities. And then when product APIs are designed, say for home page, for statistics page, for a cricket, all these different sections of your page will call many APIs. Those are product APIs. And in turn, these product APIs will call multiple core APIs to get all the information which needs. And now there should be uh, one more component uh, in which sits in between product API and core API, which binds all, all, all of these multiple APIs. Well, so that is called as mixer or binder. And also, instead of writing so many product APIs, what we can do is we can give high level APIs and we can accept the query in form of JSON or XML, some sample uh, query like this. Then this is in the form of JSON, which has name, uh, which has name, leaks, player ID, what are the attributes which we are requesting for. This JSON can be sent along with the get request whenever the third party APIs are requesting for the data. The advantage of this kind of um, JSON based query or uh, you can transform this query into simple query parameters also, but it will, not, it will be difficult to read or it will be difficult to generate uh, programmatically. So you can, you can have something like um, this JSON query, which can have structured query uh, in it. You can have nested query also in it. Uh, you can send this query uh, to the product API, and then this uh, product uh, API request will be handed over into hand over to Binder or Mixer. What Binder does is it passes this query and it un it breaks the JSON query uh, into very basic format, and it understands what are the different microservices or the core APIs which I need to call to get all of this information which uh, the product API is requesting for. And also one more advantage of uh, having core APIs, product APIs, which is binded by Mixer or Binder is you can make a lot of uh, core API calls in parallel. That way we can get all the information which we require faster. So when there is a, say for example, when there is a product API request comes in, say you need a lot of information, like five different kind of entity information you need. That is one, two, three, four, five. If we write um, a single API, what happens is we will end up calling all these five different database calls in one API. But with the product APIs and core APIs format, what you can actually do is one request goes to product API and binder will pass this query and it understands we have to get five different information and it has the mapping of what microservice to be called or you know, what core APIs to be called to get this uh, all of this information. And in turn, Binder will make five different parallel calls to the core APIs and get that information faster. The maximum take, time taken uh, to get the response will be uh, whatever one of the APIs, one of the core APIs maximum uh, time taken. All the other core APIs will complete faster and that way uh, we can achieve parallelism. Uh, we can use concurrency or parallelism to get the product APIs data served faster. With this strategy, somehow we are able to call multiple core API calls by one single or uh, one product API call. There is a disadvantage of this design also. What if one API call fails for some reason? What do we do about it? There are uh, two ways we can solve this problem also. One is make this product API fail also, also fail. Uh, that way, we, uh, the uh, response will be 500. Uh, why do we need to do that? You can argue that uh, even though one API, one core API call fails, uh, the other data, the the other APIs might have succeeded, and we have the data for that. If you send that data, the problem is at the client side; they might not be expecting some part of the response is missing. That might give us to JS error or Android parsing error or something like that. Or if you are sure that your the clients 
are handling this situation of um, some part of the response is missing, then it's fine. Even if, if one, one API, one core API fails, we can send the remaining partial data available back to the client. That way, uh, we can still sh keep on showing some sections of the website or appli application and some data will be stale or some, some part of the section will be loading and might be on the next product API call or when, when the next time when we refresh, we might get that, that data back. When you have a lot of data and a lot of APIs to serve, caching is very crucial. Crickinfo has something like three-tier caching layer to solve this problem. With about 5,000 requests per second, caching saves a lot of um, hardware requirement. Without caching, your servers will be like on fire. Caching helps you to ease the load on actually all the API servers. Crickinfo actually has a TTL of about one second. You might be thinking one second cache TTL, does it really help? Say, for example, if you're getting 5,000 requests per second, if you set a cache TTL to one second, it will, um, it will make only one request to the actual core API um, or product API. That way, you will actually uh, end up serving 4,999 um, requests from the cache which is either local or either distributed. When I say three tier, um, the first uh, level of caching is inside the product API servers itself. This product API servers is also horizontally distributed and each of the server will have its own local cache. Crickinfo uses eh cache for the local cache and also they use memcache uh, for the distributed cache. First, whenever the API calls, uh, whenever the API call hits the product API, if the API is a really hot API or very important API with a lot of requests coming in for that, they save that the response for that API in the local cache itself. And why uh, aren't they using distributed cache for that reason is because first of all, the API is used a lot. And if we make a call to distributed cache, which is in other data center or, or either in the same data center, there will be a network uh, call involved in it. So that is the reason why the, some of the response or the data is saved in the local cache itself. Having said that, we can't say, save everything into the local cache because we have limited memory in the local cache, right? So all the other uh, non-important uh, data or less traffic data will be saved into distributed cache. First, when the request for the product API lands into product API servers, first it will check in the local cache. If it is available, it will serve back. Otherwise, the request will be, the data will be uh, queried again in the distributed cache. If that data is figured out or if it is, if the data is found in distributed cache, it will be written back immediately. If the data is nowhere found in local cache or distributed cache, then the request will be transferred to Varnish. As you already uh, know that, um, Crickinfo uses something like Binder. One product API will result into a lot of core API calls, right? All the core API calls will be hit to the uh, core API servers. But between product API and core API, there will be one more caching layer called Varnish. Varnish is a lot many times used to uh, cache the front end uh, pages, APIs, like that. Uh, some of the characteristics of Varnish is it has uh, some best features like request collapsing. Uh, what is request collapsing? Um, for that, you need to understand Stampede effect. So what is Stampede effect? Say, suppose uh, there is a request to get the scoreboard uh, data or something like that, and that request is consumed a lot or that request was made a lot. In that case, say, for example, we're getting about 5,000 requests per second. For the very first time, uh, when the request hits the product API, it will check uh, in the local cache and also in the distributed cache. It won't find the data. And then the request will be forwarded to core API. For now, forget the varnish uh, from the picture. Then the core APIs will get that compute the score, uh, scoreboard data and then returns it back to the product API and the product API responds it back. Before uh, doing the sending the response, the product API also saves that data into local cache. Now, on the second request uh, for the same data, product API can easily figure out that data from the local cache and then returns it back. 
once, uh, say for example, we have set the TTL for that data to one second. At the end of that one second, right, the last millisecond or microsecond of that uh, one second duration, the cache will be invalidated. In that case, we will obviously expecting a lot of requests, um, if not 5,000 requests per second, at that particular microsecond or millisecond, we might be expecting about hundreds of uh, requests coming in directly to product API. And all these 100 requests will check for that particular data uh, in the ca local cache. They won't find it. And then they will check in the distributed cache and they won't find it. And what happens then is, obviously we need to hit the core APIs to get the data. In that case, for the same request, all the product, uh, all the hundreds of requests will directly go to core APIs. And that is bad because essentially we're get we're trying to get the same data. Uh, even though we have a lot of cache in place, we will be making hundreds of requests to core API just because that split second or split microsecond, we couldn't find able to find the caching. And that's why we have introduced Varnish here. What it does is which something like request collapsing. If say, for example, in about 100 millisecond window, if we see, or if not even 100 millisecond window, say for example, 10 millisecond window, if we see a lot of requests coming in for the same uh, scoreboard, what we will do is we'll coll collapse all of those requests. Say all of these, uh, say hundreds of requests will be collapsed into one request and only one request, say only one request will be made to core API for that those 100 API calls and the data will be responded back to all of these 100 APIs by only making one request to the core APIs. And then that request collapsing will be made by Varnish. And that's how you, you can solve this stampede effect. These problems will not occur when we have about uh, hundreds, just hundreds of requests per second and very simple setup of having just a simple API service will work out. But when we have about 5,000 requests per second, these kind of problems will occur. We have to think um, closely, uh, we have to see closely of how the API interaction is happening between each and every component and we have to solve piece by piece. And uh, when we have a lot of different uh, caching layer, that is three tier caching layer, it is a lot difficult to debug what's happening uh, with um, if there is a bug or something like that. So what we can do is, we can respond um, with, with the response itself, we can have some kind of metadata information also, which tells you exactly um, what happened when that particular request landed at product API, which particular cache uh, was used to get that data, or uh, was the request was collapsed, or what was the duration which took, and who actually responded to the data. Is it core API, or is it, is it varnish, or is it distributed cache, or local cache, or what like that. And that way it will help us to monitor or debug uh, the bugs in the APIs. Quick Info uses histories to protect all of their endpoints like product APIs or uh, core APIs. So why do we need to use uh, histories? As we know, we are using a lot of microservices. That comes, what comes along with that is we will make a lot of network calls. And also we know that these core APIs and also product APIs are not just in one machine. They are distributed across the data centers along different regions. And that comes when, when, a, when a request uh, lands in the product API server, the product API server in turn makes call to a lot of core API server. Many things might go wrong when product API makes call to core API. Things like this core API, one of the core API might get slower because of some reason, it's because of some DB uh, latency or some kind of problems, right? In that case, because of one core API got slow, the, uh, all of the product APIs also might get um, slower. They will actually have a, some kind of cascading effect because of one problem, the, all the, uh, that problem can um, reflect back in all of the pipelines uh, in, the, in the API pipelines. Say for example, I make a request to product API and this product API is making in turn three calls to all the three different core API services. For some reason, if this core API is taking more time to respond back, um, our product APIs will keep on waiting until this particular core API responds back. When this particular thread is keep on waiting, more and more requests will be waiting for that thread to become free. 
and that's when uh, all of the requests are kind of parked or clogged in, in this uh, place or uh, in the product API side. Um, that's when we will we might uh, burn out all the critical resources and, and that would cause a cascading effect or a ripple effect on the other side of the API infrastructure. So how do we solve this? We can solve this by using some kind of circuit breaking uh, pattern. What is circuit breaking? And how can we achieve? Circuit breaking is something like um, we can wrap the API endpoints with circuit breaking object. And this circuit breaking will object will always be constantly monitoring each and every APIs. Say, for example, Hystrix is monitoring this particular uh, product um, API. What it does is whenever the request comes in, uh, lands in the uh, pro product API, and the product API is making many calls. This guy, the Hystrix, will be checking for um, how long uh, the product API is taking to respond back, or is it in good condition, or is it healthy? Uh, say sometimes if it sees that this product API is throwing error, or it is taking more time, or it is timing out, it will know that there is some problem with this product API. What it does is it will stop all the further requests going into this particular product API and it will immediately start, start throwing 500 errors. That way, more and more requested, requests are not pushed to this product API and that way it will, this history, history will let, uh, will give some time for this product API to recover itself. And also it gives you one more feature like default response fallback. Sometimes some APIs can also function with some kind of stale data, or at least by giving back the giving back the uh, response data, which is a uh, little old or uh, some kind of generic information. In that case, we can also configure for certain APIs if that API is heavily over overloaded or if that API is not properly function functioning, we can set some default response um, response fallback also. In that case, if the product API is not responding, this it will just send the default response fallback. And also, uh, it does request collapse. I just explained about request collapse to avoid stampede effect, right? The same thing can happen on the product API side. When so many requests coming in uh, to get the same information, Hystrix can combine all of the requests and respond with the, uh, and by making one uh, product API call. Say, for example, if you have five requests coming in for same data, Hystrix will combine all of that and it just makes one call to the product API and gets a response and returns five responses back to five different requests. So let's learn how ClickInfo handles or monitors all of these APIs. ClickInfo uses open TSTP, that is open time series database, uh, to monitor all of their API uh, logs or API information or any at any given point of the time to, to know the state of their APIs. What they do is they keep on logging all the information um, to OpenTSTP. OpenTSTP is specifically high performance uh, because it is built on top of Hadoop and HBase. That gives you the advantage of um, uh, we can use a lot of other Hadoop um, related tools on top of OpenTSTV and which is also scalable. We can keep on adding uh, more nodes or scale horizontally to store more and more data. And also when we want to do millions of writes per second, we can easily uh, scale horizontally. And OpenTSTV is really good in taking, um, which, is, which can take like uh, heavy write loads also. And also the very really good thing is it supports Grafana. Grafana is something uh, which looks something like this, which allows you to query, um, visualize, alert, and, and allows you to understand the metrics no matter where uh, you have stored the data. Uh, it also supports elastic search. If you have elastic search nodes, you can also build graph, which is something like this. This way we can easily visualize what's happening in our APIs or data centers or our servers and etc. So far we learned about how to design APIs and how to get the information whenever we need. That is more of a pull model, right? Whenever we need the information, we make an API call, we get the information. But these days more and more people or more and more viewers are using mobile applications. 
In that case, it is not always good to have pull-based mechanism. We should also think about push-based mechanism. That means that server should be able to push the data to the client or the viewers whenever it has the data. Say, for example, when the match is happening, server should be able to push the uh, score changes automatically without even client asking for the data. And how do we design that with um, when we have the APIs already in place? So ClickInfo has some system called as FastCast. In FastCast, how it works. So this line, uh, which tells you there is a product API and inside product API, it is going to make calls to uh, core APIs, as you know. Um, this is a laptop. So this laptops uh, mostly work on pull-based APIs, right? But these days, uh, most of web applications also is using WebSocket. It gets the information by from the server itself that is push-based mechanism. So how do we do that? Say, for example, um, we have the product API here. We should have a scheduler which is configured something like this. The scheduler wakes up uh, two or three times in a second and it has a list of all the APIs uh, which it's supposed to be checked every uh, two times or three times in a second. Say, for example, if a match is going on, we should be always sending the live score updates and commentary and uh, any other statistics information, right? So we have about a couple of, uh, about 10, 15 APIs. So what scheduler does is for every match, it just wakes up two or three times in a second. And then it queries all those 15 APIs from the product API uh, APIs. Once it gets the data, it sends it to Delta. What Delta does is it calculates the difference what it does is it knows what is the last information which I, I sent to uh, the mobile devices or any of the client, uh, and it knows what is the new information which has got. Um, it negates or it checks the difference. Say previously I sent this, now I have this data. It is going to remove all the unwanted information which already the client is having. So it creates the delta and then it puts into Redis. Redis is used as Q. You, uh, Redis can also act as AMQB uh, compliant. Uh, it supports uh, synchronous message queuing protocol and also acts as caching system. You can use Kafka or uh, RabbitMQ in this place, but ClickInfo as of now is using Redis itself. So it places the, diff, the Redis queue. Um, so there will be n number of queues, which is equivalent to n number of matches, which is happening at any given point of the time. So it, it writes that difference, uh, diff data into the Redis queue, and that data will be consumed, pushed to WebSockets, and in turn, WebSocket uh, live connection, which is established with the mobile device or even uh, with the web apps, will be pushed, um, the data will be pushed to mobile phones or laptops. And sometimes, uh, some devices are, if they can't support WebSocket, they will fall back to long polling or um, you know polling or sometimes flash based um, connections also i guess i have covered all the crucial design information which is required to design click info click buzz or espn sports like website if you like this video please subscribe to my channel and also hit a like button thank you